Well, it looks like the numbers have uh, stabilised in the room. So uh, it's my great pleasure to say welcome to everybody who's here today to our uh, event uh, called Arts, Culture and Placemaking, What Role Can Research Play? Um, this is a panel discussion, uh, among other things, uh, as part of our Place and Community initiative held, uh, organised through the Humanities Research Centre. And this was an initiative we conceived during one of the gloomiest times of the pandemic. And um, it started off with some online events last summer where we were trying to bring together colleagues from the university and uh, outside institutions, uh, mostly within York, uh, to see what our shared interests were. And since then, the initiative has, has really grown and it's absolutely wonderful to uh, be able to meet here and gather today for this next event in our Place and Community Initiative. Um, we have approximately just, well, just over two hours for today's event um, and it comes in two halves. The first part is going to be um, a panel session uh, and that will be followed by a Q&A session. Then we'll have a short break. And for those who want to stay on, which I hope many of you will, we'll break up into small groups and have some small group discussion. Uh, and we're very, very happy to welcome today people who are joining us from outside the university. We're very much looking forward to meeting you and uh, engaging with you and learning about uh, your interests and, and your uh, concerns and the things that the contributions you, you can make to our discussions as well. Um, I'm going to hand over to our Pro Vice Chancellor Kieran Trahan. Uh, she's going to introduce the speakers and get the uh, rest of the session going. So, Kieran, over to you. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, colleagues, friends, and our external partners, a really warm welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and feel a real privilege to be able to chair today's panel because. Actually, events like this are so important because they bring a community of scholars, of practitioners, of policymakers and academics together to really help us think about place, arts and community in a really engaging and thought provoking way. So, um, you know, for me, this is a real delight on a Wednesday morning. Let me start by saying just a couple of things before I introduce, you know, our incredible speakers. What we're going to do is have a series of talks and I would encourage you to think about the questions, the reflections, you know, your perspectives um, in relation to what you would like to ask or what you'd like to share. And in order to do that, I'd like you to think about what are, what are the things that are kind of keeping you awake at night? What have you heard from the speakers that have made you even more curious or challenge your thinking? And I'd encourage you to then put those questions in um, the chat box and I'll try and get through as many of those as possible um, because your voice is really critical to this debate. So without further ado, let me first introduce our first set of speakers. Um, I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome the um, NCASE director, Susie Layton. But let me just tell you a little bit about Susie so you get a real sense of the person and the kind of work that they have been doing and why their voice is so important on this agenda. Susie co-founded the Cultural Capital Exchange Programme in 2011, and since then has also developed and directed a whole variety of projects. But one that I really want to focus on today was the Exchange Project, which was co-funded by um, Hefke and the Arts Council in England between 2016 and 18. She's also a co-investigator on the Arts Council England flagship Boosting Resilience Project. And her professional background, which I just think is just, you know, really exciting and intriguing, is it encompasses dance, theatre production and management. A five year stint at the Arts Council in England as a senior officer and then a secondment as a researcher to the DCMS Select Committee. So Susie brings just a wealth of, of knowledge, experience, but also research, which is so vital in order to make some of these policy changes. Alongside that, I'm also delighted to welcome a colleague, um, Emily Hopkins. Emily is NCASE's Senior Manager for Research, Evidence and Policy, a PhD student in the Department of Geography at the Royal Holloway 
And Emily's work combines urban and cultural geographies. Um, and what's really fascinating, intriguing, is the way that she's able to bring the relational analyses um, of arts-led regeneration strategies, but really looking at the lived experience of independent artists in Coventry, um, which is really close to my heart because before I moved to York, um, you know, I was based in the Midlands and worked with a number of those kind of companies and sit on a board of an arts-based company um, in the Midlands. So I'm, I'm just really, really ple you know, pleased uh, to have Emily. Alongside that, you know, in terms of the work that's been done with DCMS in the UK, City of Culture 2021, Emily's got, you know, a prominent role throughout that. We talk about research and it's her doctoral research that she's worked with and has been a really active member of the Cities of Culture Research Network. So that's a lovely example of research practitioner and policy makers coming together to make that real, real difference. So without further ado, um, the people that I know you want to hear from are our panellists. So let me hand it over first to Susie. Susie, a really warm welcome on behalf of the university. Thank you so much for inviting myself and Emily here today and for that incredibly warm, warm welcome and introduction, Kieran. Um, I'm just going to give a very quick um, introduction and overview to NCASE's work before I hand over um, to Emily to talk about the interesting stuff, um, because as, as you flagged up, she is our place expert. Um, thank you, Emily. We're just going to share our screen. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, the, the National Centre for Academic and Cultural Exchange is a relatively new project. Um, we launched, um, well, we, we launched the project back in January this year. We, we've been working on the project since October of 2020. So you find that at us more or less at our first year anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, it's a four year project um, and the project spins out of the Culture Capital Exchange, an organisation um, that I co-founded with my co-director Evelyn Wilson um, back in 2012. We actually first started working together um, in 2005. Um, we were a higher education innovation fund project um, supported by a group of nine universities led by King's College London. Um, and we ran, um, if you like, in-house through King's for the first few years of our existence and spun out and set up as an independent organization um, back in um, 2012. And we have always operated as a membership network, but alongside that, um, we have also always been involved in the engagement and um, running design and delivery of large scale projects which bring together um, academic research from across all different disciplines and the arts and cultural sector, the creative industries and their wider partners um, throughout the third sector. Um, so we co-wrote and delivered the Knowledge Exchange Programme for Creative Works London, um, which we delivered with Queen Mary University of London. And this was one of the first um, HRC Knowledge Exchange hubs. Um, Kieran has mentioned the exchange, which was actually the first co-funded project by um, Hefke as um, UCRI was back then, um, and the Arts Council, and also recently our Boosting Resilience um, project too. So, but we're here very much to focus on NCASE, our um, current large scale project. Emily, do you want to move us on a little bit? Um, thank you. So our mission is very much about supporting and facilitating capacity for really excellent knowledge exchange and collaboration between the higher education and arts and cultural sector, with a particular emphasis on evidencing and showcasing the cultural, environmental and economic impacts of that work. And our key difference, I suppose, um, from other projects working in this space that you might be familiar with, like the Centre for Cultural Value or the Creative Policy and Evidence Centre that runs through Nesta, is that our, our focus is really laser-like on um, work with collaboration with research with the arts and cultural sector rather than research on the sector, um, which of course is 
a big part, you know, we, we draw on that research um, and we work closely with um, the cultural value sector centre and creative PEC, um, but that, that's the key difference. And we're working with four key regional partners um, to deliver NCASE to make sure that it is a truly national project. Um, Bath Spa, Manchester Metropolitan, um, Birmingham University and Northumbria University are our key regional partners, but they play the role for us very much as super connectors through their own regional HEI and arts and cultural network. And we're really delighted that at this point in the project, by the end of the our first year, we have actually interacted, we believe, with um, every single university in the in England and several of them um, from Scotland and Wales too. Um, so we work across four key areas, they're all very interconnected and as the project progresses becoming even more interconnected. Um, we do a lot of work around brokerage, collaboration, support and networking, helping to overcome some of those seemingly ubiquitous barriers um, to working together in um, this area, particularly when you're talking about very small organisations trying to work with universities. So bringing people together in the first place, tackling barriers around language, um, different motivations, funding environments, um, timescales, ways of working and so on. We do a lot of work again around skills and capacity development. Um, and I may talk about this in a little more depth um, after Emily's um, spoken about our place work, if there's time, um, but really what it takes to develop and deliver a successful collaboration where the skills gaps are, where there are models of good practice and how we can support each other as professionals working in this area of knowledge exchange and collaboration um, through peer to peer um, mechanisms. Um, for example, we're just launching action learning sets that bring together representatives from the arts and cultural sector and higher education to really creatively problem solve and build new ways of working. Emily is going to talk in detail about our evidencing and impact development work, so I'm, I'm just going to park that. Um, but we also do a lot of work about showcasing and communicating not only our own primary research, um, but all the wonderful, um, rich, complex and fascinating work that all of you are doing as well. Um, so we do a lot of events um, which are all free and open. Um, and we also run a monthly um, e-newsletter um, and are also spending quite a lot of time developing a blog which we want to really offer as a space for a community of writing around this kind of knowledge exchange work um, and to perhaps give people a slightly different platform um, to write about their collaboration work and we really warmly welcome um, blogs and contributions from people who are working with the arts and cultural sector. So if you would like to blog for us, please do get in touch. So our four key themes crossing the project. Um, again, Emily is going to um, concentrate on placemaking and we talk about levelling out. It seems marginally less patronising to us than levelling up, um, but I, I know that it's a contested term at the moment. Um, we also work, work across another three key themes, environment and climate change, technology for social good and health and well-being. These are not completely exclusive, um, but the field of knowledge exchange with the arts and cultural sector is just so rich and diverse. We felt that we had to give ourselves a focus for the project. So we're really interested in cross-cutting models of good practice and interesting projects in this area. So don't feel that if you're working um, into other topics that you can't approach us or, or come and talk to us about your work. Okay, so Emily, shall I hand over to you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Susie. Um, so yes, as Susie mentioned, one of our work packages is evidence and impact development. So a lot of our work focuses on producing our own research, sourcing secondary research, and then also compiling case studies, um, interviews, and all these other kind of brilliant perspectives from other people so that we get a really rich and cross-sector perspective of um, the cultural knowledge exchange sector. And so, as we've just mentioned, one of our four key themes is placemaking and levelling out. And so we've oriented a lot of our evidence and impact development work this year around this topic. And today I'm going to run through um, four of our key areas of work within this specific theme. 
So the first is our survey that we ran in March 2021 with Arts Professional, and this was co-designed with the Arts Professional team and spread to their network. And it was aiming to capture insights from within the arts and cultural sector, because we found that a lot of the secondary research that we'd read in relation to knowledge exchange in, with an arts and cultural focus was written from the perspective of higher education and academics. And so we really wanted to give that platform to arts and cultural practitioners to share their experiences as well. Um, I'll share a link in a second to the snapshot findings um, and we've got the full report on this survey coming out um, towards the end of this month but we also decided to focus specifically um, a place-based findings report as well which will also be released um, after we found that 64 percent of our respondents to the survey um, they had shared that their collaborations had a place or place making focus and out of a I think there was 546 respondents so it was quite a significant proportion of people were saying that they were interested in this theme and so here we've got some of the kind of key findings from that report. So we found that within these collaborations, um, arts and cultural practitioners were reporting that 30% of these um, collaborations had taken place um, with a university that was based within the same region as themselves. 64% um, of these collaborations had taken place in another region within the UK. And then 6% of these collaborations had taken place um, internationally, largely within Europe. Um, and then we also found, um, which was really um, interesting, was that um, people that were reporting their most impactful collaborations, 78% uh, of respondents had said that their um, most impactful activities and projects had taken place within um, with a university within the same region of the UK. So that's something that we focused on within the report. And so this led to um, a qualitative analysis, a thematic analysis of um, the collaborations reported because the survey was a mixture of closed text and open text um, responses. So there was lots of really rich detail to go through. And we found supporting information that indicated why people were reporting that maybe the most impactful collaborations were taking place within the same region. And that was largely because these um, kinds of collaborations were more likely to be using um, university um, resources or expertise and really have a kind of place-based focus to the collaboration. Whereas collaborations that were taking place with different regions um, were more likely to be focused on teaching opportunities, whether that was a module or a seminar or a single lecture. And it tended to be that these were quite more um, brief in duration. So it seems that there was indication there that more rich collaborations were taking place when they were closer to the partners that they were involved with. And then we also um, divided the nature of the place focused collaborations into these six key themes that you can see on the right hand side of the slide. And these are ordered um, in terms of, um, so first being the collaboration types that were mentioned most frequently, and then towards the end of the list, it was those that were mentioned less frequently. And so firstly, it was collaborations with a kind of social focused um, or those with trying to generate a social implication or impact for their local communities. Um, and that was really overwhelmingly the most reported type of collaboration. The second of those um, was those that interacted with or trained or hosted um, students from local universities. But this did also include some mentions of work with local primary schools or secondary schools as well. Um, the third most reported kind of collaboration was um, focusing on developing the local cultural ecosystem. So this was sometimes support or skill sharing sessions that had been developed for co other cultural practitioners, but developed in partnership with higher education um, academics and researchers. Um, the fourth was um, collaborations that were focused on economic development, or they had a focus on generating economic impact in an area. But these were largely aligned with um, specific predetermined pools of financial support. Um, so place based investment that was provided by their local authority, um, whether that was by central government or an arm's length body. So this was getting towards um, the kind of collaborations that were mentioned less frequently. So then a small number as well of um, practitioners were reporting that their collaborations were based on physical sites and physical regeneration, which would be that kind of typical association of placemaking. Um, but that was towards the, the bottom end of our, our frequency of reporting. But this was um, cultural practitioners being involved with the production of new theatres or the building of cultural quarters in their area and sharing their insights um, into these plans. 
And then finally, um, there were a few cultural practitioners who responded to the survey to say that they were involved as advisors or administrators or de delivery partners within cross-sector collaborative, uh, collaborative partnerships. So this was involving with HEIs, um, local authorities, business communities in their area. Um, and it was associated with the delivery of a specific cultural policy that was place-based. So this was a number of boards or consortiums or place-based partnerships. So it was really focusing on that collaborative policy landscape that, that is beginning to emerge um, in relation to placemaking. And so after we were finding these really rich findings from our primary research, we wanted to um, align some of our events with this theme. And the first of which was our collaborations in placemaking policy workshop. Um, and this took place in June 2021. And this very much spoke to the idea of the levelling up and placemaking agenda and how this was being implemented within knowledge exchange activities with a cross sector focus. And so in the first panel and the, uh, at the start of the day, we heard a lot about um, why there was the growing role of um, place-based knowledge exchange collaborations. And we heard from David Sweeney from Research England, who was really an advocate for that place-based approach. And then Emily Field, who was the head of UK City of Culture at the time um, at DCMS. And she was talking about this increasing role within bids that the universities are playing with the cultural sector. And then we heard a whole range of amazing um, case studies and examples. So on the left here, we've got Fort Burgoyne, which was a partnership between Pioneering Places, um, a cultural organisation in Kent as part of the Great Place Scheme. And they had um, master's students from the University of the Arts London come and help them to reopen um, a heritage site that had been closed for years and years um, with a new focus. And then on the right, we have the Making Suburban Faith Project, which was a collaboration between faith communities and craft communities in Northfields in West London. And that was researched by University College London and Royal Holloway to look at how the, the community is the expert of themselves and the skills that they can teach to other people in the process. And so we concluded the day with this kind of idea of what we can do to support place-based partnerships in the future. Um, and we also had a, a critical analysis of the term placemaking itself. So Val Birchall from Coventry City Council said that there was overtones of capital development with placemaking. And so she preferred to use the, uh, the term place-based and she felt that that embedded her work in the locale that she worked in even further. Uh, Nazneen Ahmed from the Making Suburban Faith Project, she proposed that we use the term making in place because she felt that the practical and tactile um, artistic knowledge that she'd learned from her project made her realise just how much we can learn from other people and how that can forge new conversations. And then finally, um, uh, Ian from Literal Arts um, turned place shaking as what happens when these place-based partnerships begin to break down or the place-making um, policy begins to end. And so everybody agreed that um, having new producers, new collaborators and new audiences was critical in placemaking collaborations for having a diversity of values within um, these, these topics. Another thing that we've done um, is we have an evidence cafe, which is our kind of space of online, um, an online community to share evidence, research, knowledge on um, cultural knowledge exchange partnerships and collaborations. And so we had a placemaking themed event um, with Dr. Rowan Bailey from University of Huddersfield and Catherine Haig from um, Kirklees Council to talk about their temporary contemporary project and how they'd work together to build this space in a kind of vernacular market that's now becoming an artistic um, venue in the town. And then there was Dr Victoria Barker who spoke about her social higher education depot which is a physical shed that gets moved around and um, to site specific locations and it's offered as a space for local communities to talk about regeneration. And again these examples are really inspiring to think about the ways in which placemaking collaborations are coming to the fore um, over the last few years and how impactful they can be for the local communities um, involved. And then the final thing that I'll quickly briefly um, talk over is our latest piece of work, which is an analysis of the KEF 2021 submissions. And so as part of this, um, the 117 higher education institutions in England submitted narratives about their local growth and regeneration um, um, submissions and how this was involved in knowledge exchange. And we found that the cultural and creative industries were largely being noted as some of the key um, partners or key um, sectors to work with in initiating such changes. And so to do this as well, we kind of extracted a top 20 um, KEF 2021 list of the higher education institutions that had um, most prominently discussed the arts and cultural sector within their submissions. Um, and I'll just flick through now. So this is a list of the top 20 and the report will be released towards the end of the month. But as we can see here, 
the only um, institution that isn't based in the south of England, which is Edge Hill University. Um, it's, it's very much showing the geographical um, nature of um, cultural knowledge exchange being mentioned by institutions and where the priorities are being emphasised within these lists. And this was kind of skewed as well by the, the prominence of the arts cluster, which is part of the KEF, um, the way that they're dividing up the KEF. And the, the um, vast majority of these are based in London as small specialist centres. But again, it's interest, interesting to have a look at the, the REF and the KEF and all of these narratives and where arts and culture is being um, emphasised within them. So that's just a really brief whistle stop tour. I'll put some links in the chat so that you can see um, this in a bit more depth, but hopefully it gives a bit more of an idea of how placemaking is featuring um, in our work end case. And I'm just going to pass back over to Susie, who'll talk a little bit more about the skills and capacity work that we're doing as well um, that supports this kind of work. Thank you, Emily. I'm going to be very brief. Um, this report is up on the NCASE website, as is all the other research that Emily has referenced. It's, it's all up and, and freely av available for your ed edification and delight. Um, but I'm just going to talk about a piece of really quite quick and dirty um, action research that we undertook um, over last summer, really to start um, trying to understand the picture around skills and capacity for this kind of work. Um, both with the, within the arts sector and higher education and indeed in, in the ways that we work together. Um, Emily, do you, you just want to flick on? Um, the, the first thing that we found, um, unsurprisingly, and this came up really through our literature review as well, which is um, also on our website, um, that actually knowledge exchange is not a term that's widely used within um, the arts and cultural sector, of course. Um, so locating it in the literature can be quite challenging. And again, um, the literature is nearly all from the point of view of the academy rather than um, the arts and cultural sector as well. But these are the kind of keywords that we were looking for um, as, as well as knowledge exchange to really help us dig down into the literature. Emily, do you want to move on again? Um, the other thing that we found, again, perhaps not surprisingly, um, is that it's difficult to locate um, examples of best practice of knowledge exchange with the arts and cultural sector within the literature. Um, we're more likely to find evidence within other sectors, health, social science um, and the voluntary sectors. Um, and that's not to say that these these um, kind of examples of good practice are not relevant, replicable um, or appropriate for the work that we're doing with the arts and cultural sector. Um, we're, we're just noting that. Um, do you want to move on again, Emily? Thank you. Um, but also that the literature reckons recognises that there is what we call the missing middle, um, the how, if you like, of collaboration and knowledge exchange between the arts and cultural sector. Um, and what we're seeing is that this is leading to projects that aren't always as resilient as they could be. Um, we've heard from both our arts and cultural partners and um, our academic partners, for example, that there isn't enough time that isn't directly focused on project delivery or development to really talk to each other, um, to understand values, motivations, and to think about how we work together as well as what we would like to achieve. And as a result, um, you know, many people reported back to us that during COVID in the pandemic, um, their relationships dissolved. Um, arguably at a time when both partners, both collaborative partners needed each other most, those partnerships just weren't resilient um, to, you know, overcome this huge spanner in the works. Um, so one of the things that we are trying to do through our work is to provide these spaces, places and platforms for um, these more engaged discussions about how we work together. Um, so you know, what one of our primary recommendations um, from this evidence and literature review is that we really need to work together to co-design um, approaches to working together, methodologies and processes that are truly mutually beneficial. Um, and that actually in this respect, higher education has a lot to potentially learn from the way that the arts and cultural sector work, um, which is an intrinsically um, relational way of working rather than a transactional way of working on on the whole um, so you know that they play a really important role for us within the academy thinking about how we might 
um, enact more resilient and strategic knowledge exchange. Um, so I think I'm just going to stop there. As, as I've said, all our reports um, and research is available um, on the website. All our events are open to everyone. Um, the projects that I mentioned, the Exchange, Creative Works London and so on, you can um, access all, all those reports, evaluations and so on through the TCC website and I'll pop the link in the chat shortly. But I think we'll follow, we'll finish there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you so much, Emily. I was really struck by your powerful, um, you know, in inspiring presentations. And I just want to kind of draw three things um, which gave me, you know, lots of food for thought. Um, I really like that notion of, of levelling out and, and how you're providing some really critical thought about partnerships, um, but in the context of levelling out rather than levelling up. I thought you helped provide a much more nuanced understanding of the lived experience of knowledge exchange. You're absolutely right. It's a term that we use, you know, constantly in academia. But what does it mean to the very world of practitioners that we are working with engaging? Um, and it almost kind of feels like it's missing in action. Um, I was really heartened to see the work that you're doing in action learning because that's really close to my heart and my own research area. Um, and I really like the notion of the way that you were using action learning, both to connect and disconnect, you know, in the way that you were bringing a much, much more sharper focus to cultural, social and environmental exchange, but not in isolation, you know, how they work together. And I guess putting that research knowledge to work um, and this notion of shape shakers, I just think is superb because in some ways you're using processes of disruption, but as a vehicle for enhancement to help us think differently. And for all of those reasons, I know there'll be a steady stream of questions, um, you know, when we listen to all of the presentations. So a huge thank you, really powerful and thought provoking. Colleagues, I'm, I want to move on now to our second set of presentations. And I'm really delighted to move from external speakers to internal speakers. Our first speaker is um, Rachel Cowgill, who I'm absolutely delighted. So I've had an opportunity to work with Rachel. Um, Rachel brings an infe infectious passion and commitment to the work that she does. Um, Rachel joined the University of York as Professor of Music in 2019, and she's held a number of professorial positions at Huddersfield, Cardiff, Liverpool Hope, to name a few. Um, currently, Rachel is the research theme champion for creativity and a principal investigator on an AHRC funded project. Um, the Internet of Musical Events, Digital Scholarship, Community and the Archiving and Performance. And it's this particular theme that she's going to kind of focus on. So it's with real delight and pleasure because I love listening to Rachel. Um, you know, she just inspires me every time she comes up with an idea. So Rachel, um, the floor is yours and a warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed. That That's really lovely to hear. I, I'm just going to share some slides. I've, I've got a, a presentation for us all. Um, as usual, there's a lot of material and I'm not uh, going to talk about it in detail, but these slides will be available um, to anyone who wants to follow up um, uh, after the talk. Um, so I've called this uh, Music in and as Cultural History um, and the emerging area, uh, a term unfamiliar to many of us in the UK, but it's, it's starting to emerge in the States, uh, linked of course to the idea of public history, uh, public musicology. I'm a professor in music, I work at the boundary between music and cultural history, how music is both part of and shaped by cultural history. And there is a lot from that perspective that we can uh, make available as, a, uh, as a, a sort of space to work with communities to explore particularly the rich musical heritage that we have uh, available to us embedded within our communities, within people's personal archives and the libraries and archives around us. And working, of course, with cultural partners and performance um, specialists and uh, concert series orchestras, opera houses, etc, etc. So I'm just going to um, follow the brief I've been given, which is to talk a little bit about how I've got to where I've got, and then to talk about the Internews project and some recent developments in this space. So I'd just like to put, a, put in a plug for music departments in universities generally, and um, my own, of course, in particular, uh, we are outward facing departments. Uh, we run education workshops, we run concert series for our universities, but we're also involved in providing programme notes, concert talks, 
uh, radio and TV work for external organisations. And um, we are, of course, very keen to embed our students in the rich cultural life around us to give them real world experiences that shape them up for what are likely to be portfolio careers um, that they develop as, as they leave. And that creative entrepreneurship opportunities there that I've just added in the middle of the screen is a point that I think runs through from this sort of work that music departments generally do into the opportunities uh, we can explore uh, for research and knowledge exchange and co-creation and co-collaboration. Um, and of course, all of these activities really take us into the area of impact and knowledge exchange. So a little bit about how I've got here. Um, Basically, I have been exploring cultural engagement opportunities that have arisen from my own research practices that have evolved ever since I did my PhD further away than I care to remember now. Um, I, as a PhD student, was starting to experiment with digital humanities techniques, um, collecting, gathering and analysing data from newspapers from the 19th century uh, relating to performances and concert life to enable me to study um, and explore large scale change from decade to decade in repertoire, movement of musicians, development of institutions for performance and that kind of thing. And then as I kind of moved th through my career, the general pattern within humanities has been a uh, kind of move from research methodologies that are focused very much on transcription when you're in the archive from primary sources to photographing those sources and having them available to you as you're working at your desk. Um, and this has also opened up to me in my own work, digital possibilities, the possibilities of digital to enable us to collaborate between ourselves as teams of, of researchers, but also um, dif different ways of presenting work um, in publication. And, and I've often been quite frustrated by the flatness of some academic publication books and articles, particularly when you're dealing with music, uh, where you need to uh, obviously or you really want to share uh, sonic material, images, um, images of archival documents that are germane to your um, arguments and that enable people to explore the things that you're talking about. So the 3D-ness, the potential to create uh, our academic publications with a kind of 3D dimension to them was something that I really wanted to explore. I've always worked in local archives as well as national and international archives. So I've got this very embedded sense of place. All my work is dedicated and interested in deeply working with the idea of space, of, of place. Um, but of course, you know, we bring those places and that in-depth knowledge of different places together uh, in the work um, that we do. And from that, I've started to develop co-creative methods and um, projects working with cultural organisations, particularly performance or organisations and um, ideas, um, inspirational uh, ways of developing music heritage so that it becomes particularly during the last 18 months that we've been going through the COVID uh, experience, how our archives our community digital archives can themselves become a resource for building forward. Um, so uh, for those who uh, would like to know a little bit more, uh, there is a, a concert uh, database uh, website that I've been part of that sort of summarises some of those early projects that I've just been talking about there. Uh, you're very welcome, obviously, to explore that and to explore the work of those I've collaborated with, people like Christina Bashford and Simon McVeigh, both in the US and the UK. Um, but I just wanted to sort of emphasise this idea of place in the bigger picture of the work that I do. So I have worked collaboratively on collaborative volumes. It's a word I use a lot. Uh, for example, looking at musical cultures in British provincial life, very much located in place. Um, and uh, within that, exploring uh, relationships between those local identities and international and intranational um, um, ideas and identities. Um, so the local also enables me to talk about the global. Um, so for example, from a European perspective, how opera has um, uh, disseminated and shaped ideology and, and politics between different states and cultures, and then the development of a whole cultural identity within music heritage, that of the, the prima donna who emerges in the course of the 18th century into the almost mystical diva-like figure of the, the 19th century in the grand opera tradition. 
So that's a little bit about where I've come from and my background. And it's definitely felt it's been an opportunity this to to reflect on how it has felt uh, in, in terms of uh, my evolution of uh, practice and making sense of the way uh, that I work and what opportunities that's opened up to me. So um, working with collaborators in uh, the University of Illinois and um, Borthwick Institute here at the University of York, Swansea University and the Cranach Centre, uh, which is a performing arts centre um, in Urbana-Champaign, part of the University of Illinois, and the British Library, we were able to get funding um, uh, earlier this year to start a project called the Internet of Musical Events, Digital Scholarship Community and the Archiving of Performance. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. These are my very fine collaborators and here they are in person. Um, that tells you a little bit about where they come from, but I'd also like to highlight that these are musicologists working with computer scientists, information science specialists, library and performance organisation personnel. Uh, and of course, this was within the context of a funding stream that brought cultural um, organisations and institutions together with universities to co-create research. This is a very texty screen. It, it, it highlights the, the key research aims on objectives. Um, I'm just going to sort of hover there. I don't want to go through them particularly, um, but there's an emphasis not only on exploring how um, performance organizations have reflected the changes within their communities over time, but also uh, what might be good practice or the best practice for facilitating digitally enhanced collaboration between academic and cultural institutions. Um, and there are a lot of methodological innovations uh, that are emerging, she says confidently, <laughs> emerging in the course of this project that have implications for other sorts of work. And I'll talk about that in a moment. There are three work streams divided up between them. The first two are kind of specific in their themes and the third is designed to create the uh, digital innovation that supports uh, our work and our research in the first two. So briefly, my research stream is looking at the British Music Society, which was an organisation, contrary to what you might think, was set up immediately after the First World War to re-establish cultural exchange in music between Britain and uh, uh, countries elsewhere in the world. So despite the fact it implies something really quite inward looking, it was a supranationalist uh, international organization designed to uh, re-establish that cultural exchange that had been lost during the conflict. It was the brainchild of a man called Arthur Eaglefield Hull, who was a British music critic and organist and composer. And he um, created or, or, or compiled as general editor an extraordinary volume in 1924, uh, which captured the modern in music uh, globally. So he had correspondents from all over the world submitting articles about composers and works um, in their area, which was gathered together and it gave us a kind of global snapshot of modernism as it emerged, emerged in music at that time. Uh, we can get his public profile from all the kind of archival documents that relate to him. But again, what struck home to me was when I was doing my research into Arthur Eaglefield Hull, who in that had established this society, what his local society, his local uh, place and community had left in terms of reminiscences and uh, information about him as a personal figure. And in this case, uh, one of the uh, pupils that he himself had taught. Um, in his uh, role as a music teacher at his local grammar school in Huddersfield. And this is a reminiscence that, that gave me a whole new dimension to him as a character, adding a lot to what I've been able to pick up from the, the public, the public sources that enabled me to build his, his biography. So uh, why is this interesting? Well, the British Music Society, um, Arthur Eaglefield Hull, set up chapters or societies across the UK. He put a lot of confidence into amateur musicians and amateur concert organizers because he felt they were able to be more independent of the very powerful um, commercial interests at work in music um, immediately after the First World War. He thought amateur musicians could stand aside from that more than professional musicians could. So these were societies run by amateurs in their local areas. 
Some of them are still going 100 years later. They have changed and evolved almost beyond recognition, but they find their origins, their roots back in the British Music Society that was founded in 1918. Of course, 100 years down the line, they're wanting to celebrate their centenaries at exactly the same time that COVID wipes out any opportunity to run performances. So in the case of the Huddersfield Music Society, for the first time ever, they were not able to present a season of concerts um, in 2019. So their centenary uh, had to be postponed. Their celebrations had to be postponed. Huddersfield Music Society has been working with us. They have a very substantial archive. Other societies derived from the initial British Music Society vision are also working with us. The Belfast Music Society, which was established in 1921, a really interesting uh, coincidence there with the establishment um, of, of Northern Ireland it, itself. So very interesting ideas about what it was at that time to perform Britishness, to sort of present yourself as a British Music Society in 1921 in that context. Work, and their archive is at the Linen Hall Library with whom we're working closely on this project. And the British Music Society at York, another BMS derived society, whose archives have been taken in by the Borthwick Institute. So they are three societies derived from the original vision of the British Music Society who, who are active still and who have substantial archives. What we're doing is bringing their archives together so that they amount to so much more than what those individual archives, those individual society archives would be and would offer on their own. So we are re-establishing that network through digital archiving. So for example, here is a syllabus from the British uh, Music Society at York, which shows their premises and it talks about their organisation, the places they operate, the people involved. Um, there is also an, a series of records that are held at the Royal College of Music and at the British Library, uh, which record um, and which um, conserve bulletins, uh, events that were held nationally in London by the British Mus Music Society as an organisation. And so we're linking those society archives to this central core of uh, London-based events and initiatives, advice on the latest music, good people to engage for your concerts, etc. nationally and getting that conversation going in 1920 about what modern is in music and what Britishness is in music. Um, interestingly, of course, uh, I recently found evidence that there were British Music Society chapters beyond the UK. So here is one that was established in Melbourne, Australia, uh, by Louise Dyer, um, performing music by Gustav Holst. There are others in Sydney and in New Zealand. So there's a colonial dimension here that also needs critique and understanding what that meant at the time. And again, that whole idea of performing Britishness in this context. Um, the quality and the interest um, of this material obviously varies from, from place to place, from a kind of researcher's point of view in terms of my own research questions and agendas. But it's absolutely fascinating to see what these local place oriented archives can tell us about bigger narratives and bigger stories. Here, um, this is, a, for example, a, a, a performance that was done by Paul Robeson in 1930 when he came to Britain. Um, this was the first time he performed in London as a fellow. So it was an important uh, visit to the UK in terms of his development as a public figure and as an actor and singer. But he also went around the provinces and did concerts. And this is what he performed in Huddersfield we're able to use the programme to link to other um, materials, to visual material and also sonic material. If I had time, I'd play that for you, Paul Robeson singing some of the repertoire that was performed at that concert. So just briefly to finish, um, there are additional material, um, additional initiatives that we are developing, specifically designed to disseminate what we are learning about community and DIY digital archiving. Um, our place was a project that was uh, funded recently by YAF, um, the um, internal uh, impact funding. And what we've done here is to put, to build and put online resources, how-to guides for local organisations, place-based societies on how to build your own archive, how to digitise, really practical ways of using phones and mobile and digitising uh, scanners to produce and create uh, a resource from your own archive that the whole community can access in digital form from their own 
um, desks, their own homes, and to link up with others with related materials. So that is our place. Uh, we've also been talking about um, another project, uh, possibly with the website uh, www.boxunderthebed.com, which is about your personal archive, how you digitize and develop and, and build your understanding of your own archive. Um, uh, that's a, another area we're wanting to go into. And uh, we could talk, Kate and Dee and I could talk about the money we've just received from the Community Renewal Fund on uh, to develop the Street Life project. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that now. That's something that we, we might want to bring in um, later on in uh, today's session. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm really looking forward and enjoying this session. Looking forward to hearing insights from my colleagues next. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, let me quote something that I've had in chat because I think it sums up your presentation so beautifully. Fantastically interesting and, you know, for me, really insightful. And we'll pick up on some of the themes that you've been talking about in the context of the um, questions. Colleagues, can I start asking um, you in the audience to think about the kind of questions you want as we move into our final presentation? I'm also conscious that we're running slightly late but actually we don't want to curtail, curtail the debate. Um, so we, we have left room in order to make sure that we get thoughtful, reflective questions, you know, and, and they're genuinely able to engage in the debate. So without further ado, I'm also delighted now to welcome two colleagues from internally, Dee Dayas and Kate Giles, who are co-directors for the Centre for Christianity and Culture um, and its new arm, Heritage 3, 360 at the University of York. A little bit about um, the individuals that you're about to hear. Dee's a professor of history of Christianity. And what's really fascinating is her research has been primarily focused on the history, experiencing significant pilgrimages from the earliest centuries to the present, and the interaction between Christian belief and practice within Western culture. And Kate's specialist is in historic buildings and combines her work at the Centre of Christianity and Culture with a role as senior lecturer at the Department of Archaeology. And I know, you know, um, Kate's work has also been, you know, really influential in the work that we've been doing around, um, you know, the Guild Hall and sort of some of the kinds of archaeology um, sort of behind that. And, and that's been really welcome. So without further ado, if I will hand it over to Dee, thank you. Thanks very much, um, Kieran. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. We all know that the arts and humanities do change the world. We can find it harder to demonstrate than our colleagues in the sciences, medicine or economics, just as the arts, culture and heritage in general are sometimes seen as optional extras, but are in fact vital to individual and community well-being and prosperity. I've been working on the interface between research and impact for many years. And I just want to share very briefly some of the things I've learned because learning is what it's all been about. I just want to give you a very quick idea of the area in which Christianity and culture team primarily operates. Churches and cathedrals in this country constitute the largest sector of, built, of national built heritage, maintain a phenomenal collection of works of art and outstanding architecture. They're major placemakers, holding the history and memories of individuals and communities. They play a vital role in tourism and other aspects of the economy. Pre-COVID, churches were attracting some 30 million people each year as visitors. They host numerous cultural events and provide a national network of cradle the grave social activity and specialist care. That's why we've instigated so many research and impact projects in this area, often collaborating very closely with social science colleagues. And this work has produced two REF impact case studies so far. I want to look quickly at three um, projects working with Historic England, the Church of England and other national partners. The first, um, Pilgrimage and English Cathedrals Past and Present, was really looking at how um, people interacted with these spaces in the past and what that can teach us about how we present them and enable visitors today um, those millions of visitors today um, and help them engage with history and other aspects of these buildings. And we use both historical research and social science tools in order to do this with the aim of reshaping 
and um, expanding cathedral policy strategy and practice. And you can see some of the partners in the project listed here. This um, million pound HRC project then gave rise to two um, further 100,000 pound HRC follow on projects. And the first um, was um, the Beckett connection using the Thomas Beckett 2020-2021 um, 20, 20, 20, anniversaries as a catalyst for heritage, tourism, education and community engagement in Canterbury and London. And um, this project was really all about inspiring and supporting and shaping tourism strategies, museum exhibitions at the British Museum and uh, Museum of London and uh, museums in Canterbury and other cultural events. And the major outputs included a, a long-term legacy of the Beckett Story website for education and public um, involvement and a digital reconstruction of medieval Canterbury, which you can see here, which is actually is now supporting a city-wide tourism strategy. We've gone, um, and I also want to show you um, the um, second project, engaging with place and managing space, which was working with the Church of England to use the research to create new national policy guidance and training on visitor engagement and for volunteers. Some cathedrals can have as many as 800 volunteers each. So this is a major area. So um, I want to, we've gone on um, with our partners to um, deliver further outputs. So when COVID struck, closing down not only church buildings, but the activities they hosted, from tourism to toddler groups, old people's clubs, GP clinics, dementia, addiction, homelessness support, um, exercise classes, concerts, the list is endless. We were perfectly positioned to start a new cross-disciplinary project, which has been running for 16 months and is feeding into government and national church policy, decision-making and guidance, and developing new, new tools to help churches with their, uh, their national um, network to make a major contribution to the recovery. So I just want to list very quickly some of the lessons I've learned from this, and you will see an Archbishop of Canterbury Bear um, on the um, picture, which is available at Canterbury Cathedral, as representing many of our partners. The key lessons I've learned during these projects and others is firstly, that impact isn't just about high quality research, it's also about relationship. External partners are not just resources to be mined, there needs to be clear mutual benefit. We must always be asking, not just what can I get out of this, but what can this do for my partners? This means working um, at co-design and putting a lot of time into understanding partner needs, capacity and organisational structures. Our big cathedrals project meant spending a huge amount of time making sure that key people at every level understood the purpose and benefits of what we were doing. But for us, their input was vital in helping us make key discoveries and seize unexpected opportunities. It means building trust, exercising patience, being flexible and being willing to learn, move out of our own comfort zone and develop new skills ourselves. Secondly, research-led impact isn't a hit and run activity. It can create connections which feed back into research and inspire new projects. And the relationships we've developed over the last decade and more are continuing to bear fruit, including a growing portfolio of national and local consultancy work. Thirdly, devising and delivering research-led impact requires wide-ranging expertise, teamwork, and professional guidance and support. Christianity and Culture has a brilliant team, but I also must say that the HRC research and impact team are one of the best investments the university has ever made. They are worth their weight in gold and they make all the difference to all of the projects that we have undertaken. And lastly, it may sound obvious, but delivering impact is not only challenging and demanding, it's also really exciting to see our research actually changing the way that people work, live and develop. And you can see some of the, just a few quotes from some of our partners about what our work has with them has achieved at the bottom of this slide. 
Transformational impact can happen from the smallest piece of research to the largest. Few of us start with a million pound AHRC grant. I certainly didn't. But what I learned along the way through many smaller projects meant that when I did get one, I was so much better prepared to make the most of it. If we weave impact into our thinking, into the DNA of our research as often as we can, it will enrich both research and tra its transformative effect. And it will help to deliver the message that the world really does need what we do. Thank you. Dee, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna save my comments. There was so much that inspired me in terms of what you said. Um, you know, the real lived experience and, and really stuck, struck by that notion of the emotional endeavor, which I'll pick up on, which is a kind of common theme reading through all of them. Kay, if I hand it over to you next, thank you. Thank you. So uh, my presentation is about a specific project in Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire. And it's really interesting to hear about colleagues mapping of the way in which universities at some distance can work with regional partners. This specific project arose out of about 13 years of collaboration with pr uh, practitioners and partners in Stratford-upon-Avon coming out of my own research on late medieval public buildings. So really what we were interested in doing, sorry, I've just uh, gone back, um, is to respond to a brief this summer around culture recovery funding. We've been working for some years with our partners in Stratford-upon-Avon to deliver a range of impact projects, supporting the Guild Chapel and the restoration of a scheme of medieval wall paintings. But during the summer, we became aware that there were challenges, both with supporting and nurturing the volunteer community that we had been working with for many years, but also bringing people gradually back to a city or town like York, which relies on tourism, cultural tourism, for its major economic well-being. We were in, invited by our colleagues at Stratford Town Trust and the Guild Chapel to develop a Heritage 360 web app a family focused COVID safe town trail, which linked the story of a very wealthy late medieval merchant who had left a lasting cultural legacy uh, across Stratford-upon-Avon. And we helped design and apply for the funding, secure it and then co-design and develop its content with the town trust, but crucially with the volunteers, supporting local businesses, particularly local production companies and film companies. And within that web app, building in a series of co-designed and co-written volunteer blogs. Many of the points I'm making here go back to the points that Dee has already made about the way in which we carry out impact at the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture and Heritage 360. We need to learn new skills. For me, I'd never written scripts before. So it was really fantastic to have the support of my team in helping me turn my academic research into something accessible. It took time and patience and uh, a lot of encouragement to enable our volunteer community to write down the research that they themselves had discovered in a way that would be accessible to wider audiences. And we had to build in that time to design and test our web app with that volunteer community as well. And I would say, again, echoing Dee's points, that many of the ideas that inspired us here came out of the Real York virtual proposition um, that we'd made to the HRC's placemaking conference back in 2020. So thank you, colleagues, for giving us that encouragement and excitement about what we could do. So in working with our colleagues in Stratford Avon, we were then able to create this wonderful web app which allows visitors to explore a series of places within Stratford-upon-Avon, all of them which you can visit without going inside, so it was COVID safe, but also gives an insight and filmed contents, working with our uh, fictional Kit, who's a late medieval wall painting apprentice, filmed by Ignite Creative, our film company, and bringing the story of these places to life, encouraging you to go inside and find out more. And behind them then sit these blog posts by our volunteers, encouraging more and more research to be carried out on their doorstep.
And we're now using this template, this web app that our colleagues Pat and James have developed in a whole series of other projects, both on our doorstep here in York and elsewhere. It's becoming a really useful business model for us and a really engaging way of selling what we do uh, to other potential partners. So the launch and the legacy here, we've been really excited by the ways in which working with our partners has encouraged new partnership collaborations within Stratford-upon-Avon itself, particularly with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, but also it's allowed us to carry on working with them to secure those next small pieces of funding, particularly as we move forward and think about conserving more wall paintings in the Gill Chapel. And we're delighted that we've just been awarded funding from the Pilgrim Trust to do some of that conservation work. And we've just launched actually last week a new crowdfunder appeal for the remaining 10,000 pounds for the next chapter in our story. So for me, rather like Dee, I suppose what I would end by saying is that out of our own personal research interests as academics that might brew away for sort of 10 or 15 years as an individual, working in partnership with colleagues in the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture and the HRC, we can deliver far more than we can on our own. And we can learn how to work with those partners really, really effectively in co-design, co-creation, and hopefully sustaining those rela relationships for the next 15 years. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me just try and draw some threads um, between the various presentations that, that we've heard. Um, DK, I was really struck, and similarly by Rachel, um, about your, your, your notion of knowledge exchange. Um, you know, the tension and the paradoxes between excitement um, and yet pain. And I know that, you know, from my own experience of working with knowledge exchange, you know, I often say, if I know what I know now, would I have done it? And the answer is always yes. And you brought that kind of um, passion and that emotionality to life. The other thing I was really drawn by, by all of you um, in your presentations about this notion of the knowledge exchange and whether the language of knowledge exchange is the right one, because what I heard you all talk about was knowledge integration, you know, taking that knowledge and putting that knowledge to work. Um, Dee, you articulated that, that so powerfully and so clearly. Um, and Kate, you reinforced that about the capacity, not just to tell any story, but a powerful story that has um, depth, that has characters, that has a start, that has a beginning. But within that story, you, you were able to kind of articulate, and again, Rachel, through images and the work that, that you were talking about, how you transformed it and made it come alive. And it, it helped me think much more critically about the way we convey research. Um, and Kate, you talk so authentically and honestly about having to relearn the art, you know, the art to use the knowledge, but in ways that struck. And the thing that I will always carry away with me, and, and I'm a great advocate for, um, and I actually think we need to kind of do more than that, which um, you said, um, Dee, which is about don't just grab and take. You know, that's not what partnerships um, and knowledge exchange is about. And this theme of co-production, we talk a good story on co-production, but if you look at the actions that underpin Kate, that's not often, um, you know, really evident. So I want to move to questions because I know that we're running out of time. Um, but so let me go with the first question. What advice would, what advice would the panelists give to colleagues who are just starting on the journey of engaging and collaborating in this way? And I'm going to ask for short, sharp answers because I want to try and get through as many questions um, as I can. Um, so Susie, in, in a sentence, what advice would you give? Oh, OK. Build your networks um spend time thinking about how you're going to work together as well as what you're going to do um think about language language is really important in this kind of work don't assume that even you both mean the same you and your um, collaborative partner mean the same thing by the word research for example um and watch out for scope creep Great, thank you. Dee, I'm going to come to you because you, you, that was such a strong and prominent part of your, your, your presentation from, you know, small seedlings to, you know, um, waiting for the, the big one. And I'm on your side on that one. You know, and um, when I look at my own research, it was 
my colleagues used to say, what did you see in the small things that we didn't that ended up then ending up, you know, in a 2.6 million grant, you know, and you articulated that. So what's in a sentence, what would you advise, you know, colleagues that are just starting out on this journey? I'd say take every opportunity to work with people and to give to them because investment in relationship and um, offering things to people often will cut, build trust and, and, build, and bear fruit later on. And also remember that organizations are made up of people and people have their own needs, their priorities, their own busyness, and you need to treat them as people, not just as objects that you're going to get something from. And if you build that trust and relationship, even in a small way, you, you never know what will come out of that relationship later on. Great, thank you. Emily, I wanna change tack and I'm gonna to come to um, Emily and Rachel. We talk a lot about knowledge exchange and Emily, you articulated really, really powerful for what I'm gonna term knowledge integration, you know, putting that knowledge to work. Is, is the term knowledge exchange actually helpful or constructive? And that's like a big essay question. I'm asking you just your, you know, your personal reflections in a sentence. Yeah, that's the term marker, isn't it? Um, I think that if we're thinking about the history, so obviously I've, I've spent a lot of time with the secondary resources and we look at the history of knowledge transfer and how that was initially used to kind of describe this kind of work. I think that there is a lot of importance of the word knowledge exchange because of that emphasis that it places on the mutually beneficial. So it's not looking at the one direction, it's looking at how in both directions that's going to be impactful. So I think that there is a lot of value there and especially in the arts and cultural sector where that kind of word is becoming a lot more popular to describe the work that's been going on within universities and moving beyond that transfer model. So I think that there is still value in um, using that term, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yes, I, I really like this knowledge integration because uh, exchange, it seems to me, feels like, well, I have this here and I'm going to give this to you and you have that there and you're going to give this to me. Uh, integration feels so much more holistic. Um, also, that sense of a journey that actually we don't really know what the knowledge is going to be that we're bringing together and we've not we've not got a clear sense of what it's going to lead to. Um, so I, I like the integration. I also like the sense of uh, it being a, a relationship through through time where your sense of what the knowledge is and your objectives will change and develop into things that at the beginning of the process you wouldn't know but would, would, would come from this. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Susie, thank you also for putting into chat, you know, a link about the kinds of impact that you can get from really small projects. We often think about impacts as this huge thing that takes years. And actually, you know, um, there are some absolute exemplars in the way that you've articulated. Colleagues, I know this debate is going to continue and I know that you have some um, breakout groups to come. So let me just do a couple of um, thanks and then hand it back to Richard. I started off by saying this morning, um, what it's a real delight and a privilege for me to be chairing it. And I meant that, you know, that came from the heart. I didn't do this because um, it felt like the right thing to do. And I'm never disappointed. Um, after a decade of working in this area, I never stopped learning. And, and I think for, what, for, for me, what you did is you helped me rethink much, much more critically about this notion of change and transformation. But you also helped put the relational and the emotion back into knowledge exchange, knowledge transfer work about what impact in place means. And then finally, um, it is it's actually humbling, you know, to hear the work that you do, the difference that it makes. And I hope it will inspire um, not just people um, that are listening to this, but future generations to come and re, I guess, light um, our mid-career researchers, you know, and our professors because the whole purpose of this process is that we never stop learning. And for that, I'm absolutely grateful. Can I just say a huge thank you to um, Richard and Helen and the team who've worked tirelessly behind the scenes. You know, we just rock up and these things happen. Um, they, they happen because of the hard work of colleagues behind the scenes who have thought really hard and long about the kind of contributions um, inputs like this make. And without you, the speakers, for your really powerful and insightful thoughts, you know, um, a personal thank you from me and on behalf of the university. Richard, I'm handing back to you. Kieran, thank you very, very much for sharing this with such passion and energy and for drawing together such, in such a beautiful way the, the strands that have come out of this discussion. Thank you very much. 
We are running a little bit late, um, but uh, what we are proposing to do is if there are one or one, two maybe, but very short questions, we'd like to finish by 10 to 12, then we'll take a five minute break and regather at five to 12 before we join the breakout groups. So if anyone has got a, a short question that they want to ask, please stick it in the chat. Uh, if you're planning to stay on but haven't yet let us know through Eventbrite, please get in touch with Megan Russell through the chat and Megan will uh, um, fit, stick you into one of the breakout groups that we'll be holding later. Uh, and I will also just give a quick plug for our, our next Place and Community event. We, we've got a, a, a Place and Community fund uh, which we can use to uh, facilitate some new partnerships and working together with people and uh, we want to launch this in the middle of December. Uh, it's going to be a, a networking event and we very much welcome both academic and external partners to, to that event. I've put a, a link in the chat, I'll put it again, again in the chat. Uh, we'd very much welcome contributions to that of any kind of format, uh, including uh, dance and music, if you like, uh, being very wide ranging in what, we, what we'd like. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I suggest that we take a break here now and we'll come back uh, and restart at 11.55. Uh, and then we will go into the uh, breakout groups then. So thank you again to everybody for joining us for this morning session. That's been really very, very thought provoking. And uh, we can see also those who are leaving have found it that way. So thank you everyone uh, for your contributions. It's been really inspiring and we're looking forward to discussing some of this, these ideas and thoughts uh, in a bit more informal setting shortly. So we'll see you in about five, 10 minutes at 11.55. Thanks, everyone. Richard, you're muted. Sorry, stupid. Uh, are you still still sharing your screen, Megan? No. Yeah. You are there. I think it's maybe better if you don't. Then we can all see each other. Thank you. Uh, I've just been uh, looking at the Padlet and seeing uh, some of the comments there. It looks fantastic. Um, but there were two groups, right? So I wonder if we could hear from each each one of the groups. Who, who'd like to go first? I saw you nodding, Kate. So can I pounce on you? I was nodding you... about the Padlet. I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. Uh, well, we we had a we had a fantastic discussion from contributors in our group, m many of whom had a sort of really shared interest in creative cultural practices, particularly around performance practices, music practices, and the ways in which heritage and placemaking can feed into that. We had, some, we had some really interesting and provocative conversations about 
what placemaking might feel like for people in York who are residents, you know, what places, what narratives we sometimes hear about, it's not our place, it's a place for tourists, that's for them, this isn't for us. So we know that the city centre is this really rich space in which the ebb and flow of people within and between streets and buildings can be incredibly powerful. And we were reflecting back on um, some of the most uh, powerful transformative experiences like blood and chocolate, the wagon plays, the abilities of these cultural co-performance practices to remake and reshape places that are thick with memory and that we need to understand the memories of those places, but we also need to give people the power to change and shape them. And that includes, for example, the ability to use new spaces that the university uh, says it's making available like the Guildhall. Um, for those kinds of activities. So how are we going to deliver as a university on that strategic aim to, to open up those spaces? It would be great to hear about. We had some fantastic little initiatives that we were hearing about bubbling up. Um, Chris was, was reminding us or explaining um, the ABC uh, model that he popped in the chat. I think I'd love to hear more about that um, and have maybe a discussion about that. But we were also hearing for, from Rachel about the York Explore initiative with community libraries as hubs out with the city centre. So what can we do to take um, co-design practices, collaboration out of the centre of York and into the suburbs, village halls, uh, community libraries, parish churches, other spaces in which we can go to where people are. And there were lots of metaphors coming through about um, walking alongside people, starting where people are, lots of place-making metaphors that seem to really, really fit that. So I think um, Chris also reminded us of the cultural leaders group and the fact that they meet, they represent the university and other arts and cultural sectors, and that um, they have an agenda, they have a, a, an interesting research agenda, and that we should be embracing that, and particularly some of the initiatives about hybrid delivery of creativity and digital, um, early music festival, aesthetica, that kind of thing. So a rich area of potential, but also a reminder that the past year has shown us how fragile some of our cultural institutions in the city are, um, particularly when the people who we rely on, those networks that Susie was talking about, when those people are furloughed, when they're not there, you know, initiatives stop. So people are really, really crucial to this and networks exactly as, as colleagues um, said are crucial to this. So I think that's kind of captured where we, where we are. Thanks, Kate. That, that's brilliant. Oh, thanks, Bethan, for the, uh, the, the the tip about the cultural leaders group. Would you would you like to say a quick word about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, the cultural leaders group is at its very kind of end um, point. It's going to reform into an open and equitable culture forum whom anyone who works in the culture sector in York may join, um, which will then have an elected representative group to drive forward the culture strategy for the city. Um, so we don't have public information about that just yet, but it is forthcoming in the next few weeks. So please keep an eye on our website. Um, and um, I will be asking the cultural leaders group to get the word out as well. So if you have connections to the sector already, I hope you hear about it. Um, and please do join. We would love to have more academic voices in that group. Well, that, that's really great to hear. Thank you. So uh, when we look forward to hearing more about that and we will happily spread the word if that will be appropriate for us to do. Uh, so we've heard from one group. I, who was in the other group and who would like me, to... Me, Richard. You remember me. John, OK. Uh, so I think I think we were the, um, maybe the awkward squad. We, we took all those difficult words and, and pulled them apart again. And um, uh, we, we talked a bit about how, how place uh, can relate to home and uh, Keith talked about that innate um, need, need and, and desire to create and uh, manufacture a, a home and a place of dwelling. But also, I think there was a, a lot of discussion about um, place being loaded slightly with aspects of privilege in that, that not everybody um, has access to the place that they want to call home. Not everybody has access to a place that is constant and they may rely on a remembered um, home or a remembered place and that we must be careful to have that inclusive and Beth uh, spoke about the, the, the York strategy and, and how that is about a, a more democratic and inclusive uh, sense, sense of place and, and particularly 
um, not focusing just on the historic core of York and that we need to engage the people who live at some distance, both culturally and physically from that in the estates that, that grew up around York and has, it has a very wide penumbra around it uh, of where, where people live, a lot of people live who need to be connected to that um, cultural capital, need to be connected to the events that, that go on. And we know that there is good work going on with that, but um, whether that's reflected in some of the vocabulary and some of the terms that um, academia choose to use or, or the structures around it choose to put onto that is perhaps bears, bears scrutiny and bears, bears re-examination from time to time so that they can be uh, more flexible and, and, and uh, actually more accommodating and inclusive to people who have ideas that they want to develop because place is already there it's not something that we as a group are discovering it, it's something that is there and, and lived and has a history to it and actually what we do is um, to facilitate the, the the expression and the articulation of, of place in, in in new ways and and give them support and resource to do that in increasingly exciting and creative ways and that's kind of the role of the arts and humanities to facilitate that um, uh, so we talked a lot about that and we talked about um, the, 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 the idea that Susie raised in her presentation about the missing middle and creating that framework, which is something that allows um, all the partners who want to come together to contribute to that and, and to make it grow and to give it the flexibility to change and to develop as it comes along. So that was, that was sort of where we concentrated on our ideas and we drew very much on the experiences of, of, of people in the group um, from the from the railway towns and, and York's role of industry and how that affects people's access and perceptions of place and how they can change those those places uh, and also uh, Bethan's work in York and uh, Susie's work in Ashford which um, uh, was some exciting stuff actually about um, the, partnering with the MacArthur Glen to bring contemporary dance um, uh, to the to the good people of, of Ashford. So yeah, that's where we got to. Well, it's both some really fascinating um, discussions. Um, we have a few minutes left and I, I wonder if you would mind, Susie, if I, if I look at you, do you, I, I wonder, do you have any reflections from, from your, you know, your experience and, and the things that you were presenting earlier this morning? Have you any reflections on the discussion that we've had? Are there things that you think we might usefully, you know, take away or, or work through or? Um, oh gosh, I, I just would like to repeat what I said in the group actually, that it was incredibly inspiring hearing about the work that you um, and colleagues are doing at York and really hearing, um, you know, you talking about co-design and collaboration um, and co-creation, which you don't always hear about in, in these forums. Um, and I've, I've been aware of your work um, at York for quite a long time, actually, personally, this exchange project that has been re referenced a couple of times, I, I had the sort of privilege to um, interact with uh, several of the ECRs on the White Rose um, DTP programme. And, and just really, it's obvious to me that here, here is a group of people who are thinking about knowledge exchange in, in really kind of creative and valuable ways. And I also said in the um, breakout group, it, it would be fabulous if when writing about your work, you have the opportunity to think and, and write about the how, um, as well as the what, you know, towards this kind of trying to fill the missing middle. Um, and if there are opportunities to involve the voices from your arts and cultural partners in, in thinking and writing about the how as well, I think in terms of available literature, that would be incredibly valuable. Um, and I, I just wanted to, as well, see, seeing as I've, I've got another minute, um, and I did drop something in the chat about here, just to kind of talk a little bit about that um, TEF, um, narrative analysis that you picked up on um, and I think for us at NCASE that the sort of really interesting thing is yes you know there there is a point to be made around geography um, and partly that is because these small art specialists are clustered in in London and the southeast and there are all sorts of you know historical reasons around that 
But for us, I think one of the really interesting things was um, that we didn't see Russell Group universities in, in that list of organisations talking about their knowledge exchange with the arts and cultural sector in those KEF narratives. And we absolutely know that's not because there isn't rich, complex, valuable and exciting work happening. It's that at some point there was an institutional decision made not to talk about that work or to privilege other areas of work in those KEF narratives. And I, I think, you know, for, for those of us working in the arts and humanities and working in knowledge exchange with the arts and cultural sector who absolutely know the importance and the impact of our work, um, that raises all sorts of interesting challenges and questions. Thanks, that was really, really worth hearing. Thank you very much. Um, before we finish off, are there any other thoughts anyone would just like to share? Or questions or ideas that they would like to- just Richard, can I, can I just ask, I think we've got, you know, we were asked to think about how we encourage junior colleagues to do this. And that's one of the wonderful things that the HRC does. And just on Susie's point, you know, I think there's a disparity between what our core academic departments see as underpinning research that's referable mm. and, and then the impact case study narrative that we build around a successful project that's had an impact researcher on it. We're not, we haven't yet found a way of finding places for publication or ways of writing, co-writing reflectively and discursively about the how, Susie. And it would, and I love the idea of blog posts, but they're never going to be referable. And my hard pressed junior research colleagues who are just desperate to deliver their teaching. And it, so there's something really interesting here about how we are understanding time for colleagues in the university, making time for this kind of work, giving time, giving resource. And that's to me where the, the HRC's YAF funding for spaces for conversation is so valuable. It can be small amounts of time that really get those conversations going, but also how do we find ways of, of writing about that that are valued, seriously valued by academic colleagues? Because at the moment they're not, they're not going to make four-star ref publications. Thanks, Kate. Th th those are, are really good points. Um, we had a, a quite high level meeting last week about uh, impact and knowledge exchange strategy. And I think this matter of, you know, recognition and giving time and outlet and really understanding how much it takes was quite prominent in the discussions and I was quite heartened by that rather than it being seen as you know something that we do in our spare time or tagged on or something but actually valuing it and respecting it as, a, as an activity in its own right so I'm feeling a little more optimistic about that uh, I also just will plug our knowledge exchange um, our place and community knowledge exchange fund which I, I really hope is has a rapid response element to it so and we know that people can do amazing things with small amounts of money so any, any academics in the room please do encourage colleagues to um, apply for that because I think it can facilitate all kinds of interesting things in in ways that are more liberating than our YF fund is able to I'd just like to finish off by saying thank you everybody for, for joining. It's been really a very exciting morning and I've learnt a lot from it. Lots of great ideas and uh, thoughts and, and provocative stuff coming up there, which I really hope we'll uh, manage to take forward. We, we have got a bit of a programme of events, as you can see, around place and community. So all these things do come up in various ways. but. Um, It'd be this has been a, a very helpful uh, nudge for us all so thank you very much for joining us thank you again to Susie for uh, and uh, also Emily for your work in joining us and presenting your your work so nicely this morning that was great to have you with us and also thank you to those of you who've joined us from outside the university it's always great to have you uh, with us and, and to have you as part of our conversation. We really value it and I think our conversations are all the better for being together, to, to have them together in this, on this equal footing. 
So I hope to see uh, some of you at our event in December. Natalie's put the link again in the uh, in the chat. <coughs> we really are open hearted with open doors on that event, and we really look forward to having a great networking event um, with some jollity and hopefully some face to face uh, interaction as well. So thanks for joining us. Have a good afternoon, everybody, and um, all the best. Thank <laughs> you.